Good morning and welcome to Water Canada's webinar series. My name is Kareen Lentz and I'm the content director here at Actual Media. I'll be your moderator for today's discussion where we'll be talking about the cost and value of water. Right off the top, I'd like to thank Ultra Proven Solutions for sponsoring today's discussion. All right, so let me show you a little around the Crowdcast platform. By now, you've probably noticed lots of people checking in on the right-hand side of your screen, the chat feature. Please say hello, let us know who you are, where you're from. Right above the chat, you'll see an actual media icon. If you click follow, you'll continue to be updated on our Blue Economy, or now we're calling the Water Canada webinar series as new webinars are announced. Down below, you'll see a variety of information. You can see how many people are signed into today's webinar. You'll see the polls feature where we encourage you to cast your votes. You'll also see a little green button that links to the speaker's websites. You'll notice that change that changes intermittently, so be sure to check those out as well. And most importantly is the ask a question feature. Don't be shy about becoming part of the conversation. We'll do our best to answer as many questions as possible where it makes sense in the conversation. Looking at our attendee list, I can see we have lots of familiar faces. So welcome back, everyone. For those of you that are turning in, tuning in for your first Water Canada webinar, I do strongly encourage you to visit the Water Canada events page, and you can see recordings there of all the webinars we've done in the last 18 months or so. We have a powerhouse panel of speakers lined up for today, but before I introduce them, I would like to take a minute to acknowledge the many First Nations and Indigenous peoples of Canada as the original stewards of this great country. I'm in Toronto, which is located on the traditional territory of many nations, including the Mississaugas of the Credit, the Anishinaabeg, the Chippewa, the Haudenosaunee, and the Wendat peoples. We all share in the responsibility of our natural infrastructure, and there is much we can learn from the traditional knowledge of the land, water, and materials that allow us to build projects that benefit all Canadians. So, Let's get started and meet today's experts. I'm going to begin by inviting each of our panelists to the screen. Once they're all on screen, I'll have them spend just a few moments to introduce themselves, tell us a little bit about where they're from and what their role is, and, we'll, and what perspective they're bringing to today's discussion. First up, from City of Toronto, we have William Fernandez. We'll just give him a moment to get here. There he is. Morning, William. Morning. Next up, we have Kathy Basilakos, who recently served as counselor for the city of Stratford. There's Kathy. Good morning. And we have Robert Haller from the Canadian Water and Wastewater Association. There he is, familiar face. And last but certainly not least, we have Martin Bureau from Senexen Services. Welcome back, Martin. Hey, it's great to be with you. Man, all right. So I'm going to get each of you to introduce yourselves now. William, I'm going to start with you. So uh, you have the floor. Uh, thank you very much, Corinne. Uh, my name is William Fernandez. I'm the Director of Water Treatment and Supply with the City of Toronto, responsible for the four water treatment plants, pumping stations, elevated tanks, connected pipe in between. Uh, we produce about 1.2 billion litres of water every day and supply it to the residents of Toronto and the southern re uh, regions of York. Uh, I have been working in many lo locations in the world. Uh, my final stop is in Toronto, I guess, uh, as the Director of Water Treatment and Supply. I will now pass it on to Kathy. To Kathy. <laughs> Hand it over to Kathy. Good morning, everyone. My name is Kathy Vasilakos. I was a, a City of Stratford Councillor for eight years. I was chair for four years. I was chair of the Infrastructure, Transportation and Safety Committee, which included all of our water services oversight of those. I also served on the Ontario Municipal Water Association for a number of years uh, and I was vice president and more recently I was part of their lead working group which produced a position paper on lead service lines in Ontario and um, how to address them. Fantastic, thank, thank you. you. All right Robert, you're up next. Hey, good morning everyone. Yeah, it's Robert Haller, Executive Director of the Canadian Water and Waste Water Association which is the national voice for our sector across Canada. We represent all the utilities in Canada to the federal government on everything that they're doing there. So whether you're a member or not, I'm speaking for you. So you should be a member, so find out crazy stuff I'm saying. <laughs> uh, and, I, and I came to this job after 20 years as a municipal leader, including CAO of uh, small and medium sized communities. Awesome, thank you. All right, Marte. Well, first of all, it's an honor to be uh, surrounded by such experts. My name is Martin Bureau. I'm Vice President Innovation at uh, Senexen, uh, and we, we develop uh, water solutions. We go under the name Ultra Solutions, and we're sponsoring this event. 
my role is to uh, identify and address the most challenging and most important uh, issues that we're facing with water, uh, focusing on preservation, protection, and solutions where you can protect or preserve. Uh, we've addressed water main renewal, uh, leader in the world for that. Uh, lead line services, done a lot of job with uh, in Quebec and in Ontario, as a matter of fact, with Toronto. And emerging contaminants, uh, the most important of which uh, being today uh, PFAS, uh, fluor fluorine compounds uh, that uh, are threatening us. That'll be a pleasure to, to be with you today. Awesome. Thank you all. I think we are in for a lively discussion today. Our panel got together on Monday for a test session, and I can tell you that even then there was some lively debate. So let me set the scene a little bit for today's discussion. Uh, so after Walkerton, Ontario municipalities were tasked with ensuring their populations had access to clean, safe drinking water in a way that was financially sustainable. That this meant in order to protect people, they'd also be responsible for enforcing a program of increased costs for water usage, a trickle down effect that some feel is not only warranted, but absolutely necessary in order to combat critical repair deferrals and ensure well monitored water distribution, while others feel this unfairly targets vulnerable community members. We're here today to discuss how municipalities can ensure safe, equitable water delivery and treatment through utility rate structure that's fair, but also provides the necessary funds for ongoing maintenance and operations. It is a lot to tackle for an hour, uh, but let's start here. In Canada, we're surrounded by water, which makes it feel like water is free. The first question I'd like to pose to our panel today is what don't people know about how much it costs to ensure we have access to clean, safe drinking water on our taps? And, and Kathy, I was going to start with you, with your role as counselor. You've, you've first had firsthand experience in dealing with what the general public knows and doesn't know on the topic. What have you seen? Uh, you know, by and large, as, as a city councillor, I don't get a lot of complaints about water or a lot of complaints about um, you know, the cost of water. We get a lot of complaints when they're doing the hydrant flushing and people can't do their laundry because of, you know, the water is brown. But we don't, I, when I first moved to Stratford, I called up our water division and I asked them about lead in water, what kind of water, what's the hardness. I asked, you know, about water and they said, okay, we don't get many of these questions about our water. And so what I think, I, I, people care about if their tap turns on, water comes out and if it's safe to drink. I think they don't really understand the number of components that go into making sure that that happens. And and I, I will say after years of if it's infrastructure that's visible, people understand it more. If it's infrastructure that's under the ground, um, they don't understand it as as much. And I and it, it, it seems to spill over, I will say, to the people who make the decisions as well, right? Because you, you, you tend to follow the things that people complain about, you know, road conditions, snow clearing, things like that. So it isn't so much that people don't know the value of water. They just simply don't understand, you know, the, the complexity that goes into um, getting water to your tap and also the complexity of the regulatory pieces and the, the, the paperwork and auditing that goes into ensuring that. So I, that's sort of my take on it. Fair enough. Robert, you look like you're nodding and you'd like to oh. add something there. <laughs> no, we, well, we've just, you know, years in, in small municipalities, we always joke about something being as cheap as dirt. Well, dirt is so much more expensive than water. You should say <laughs> cheap as water. Imagine a truckload of dirt and how much it costs to get to your house versus that much water treated, delivered, taken away, and, and people haven't seen that. It's been historically you know, undervalued, historically underpriced, and it has taken us a decade or more, and William can probably speak better to that effort of getting water pricing up to where it needs to be and, and the importance of moving the public along with you. So, um, you know, I was part of the RBC water survey for years mm. and trying to get attitudes about water. And then we did a publication with Water Canada uh, on public attitudes and how to move the public along with you and the importance of them understanding that value before you can work on the pricing. Fair enough. Did you want to jump in, William? Yeah, it, let me start off by saying, yes, water is free. If you want to go down to the lake and put a bucket in and take water or go to the river and draw, draw water, it's free. What is not free is putting a treatment plant, putting pipes, 
putting pumping stations, putting elevated tanks, and bringing the water to your house where you open the tap and you get water out. Clean, safe drinking water. That part cannot be free because somebody has to do the treatment, somebody has to put up the plant, and somebody has to pay for all that. Mm -hmm. Makes sense. Martin, I know you deal with a lot of municipalities as well. Yeah. Well, to, to ask your, your first question, uh, people uh, don't understand the, the value of water, really, how much effort is put into the, the, uh, the quality of that water and quality with a big Q. Uh, uh, people are surrounded by water in, in Canada, uh, you know, the Great Lakes, and we, we account for more than 20% of the world's uh, fresh water. But we only have a, a mere five to six percent of the renewable resources of water. So then all that water we're seeing is actually taken for granted and it's being threatened. The quality uh, of the water in the Great Lakes, I wouldn't I wouldn't go drink uh, everywhere. Uh, <laughs> that's that's a real issue. So that water we take for granted is actually being um, uh, uh, impacted by, by all our activity. And there's no linkages between um, uh, our tap and that impact. And, and that, that link should be, we're a capitalist world, it should be a cost. Uh, in Quebec, there's no tax on water or, or it's almost hidden. Most taxpayers don't even look at that small line. And that line, by in 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 terms of quantity of dollars, is is ridiculously low. So uh, that needs to change. Uh, uh, a statistic that strikes me: in August this year, 20 million Americans, so in the United States, did not have access to water. We're we're not talking some foreign country. Uh, like uh, yeah, we're talking r real issues. Uh, 90, 90 million didn't have um, add the threat to their water resources as well. So let alone the quality, uh, huge challenges ahead of us. So, so, so that value needs to be understood by the general public. And Walkerton, to close the loop on your example, was an eye opener in Canada, and it opened you know our business, Robert's business uh, for sure, and many others because. Uh, uh, for the first time, at least as I know of, water became important. Makes sense. Well, we, we've talked quite, we've talked a little bit about the value of water. Sorry, did you want to add something, Kathy? I was just going to say, Martin pointed out. Oh. I'm not sure if you can hear us, Kathy, but we're getting a note that's waiting for Kathy to reconnect. So I was um, being cited. <laughs> yeah, what, what Martin's got, he's got some people. Uh, which is back. There she is. There she is. Sorry, I don't know what, you know, it's windy here. I was just saying Martin brought up a really good point because people don't complain about their water bill in terms of their water usage. I do get complaints and I will back it up with the surcharge for the sewer. And so people value the clean water that comes out of their tap. I don't know if they often make that connection. And actually, Martin's comment reminded me, they don't make the connection of why they're getting charged a surcharge for what goes through our sewer system in the treatment plant. So that is an interesting connection. Very much, yeah. Very much, yeah. 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 Huge, 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 role huge, required huge role required by all of us in order to... Um, you know, educate the public every time you know we have a doors open program in Ontario. You know, sometimes we'll let them into the water plant, the wastewater like the plant. The wastewater plant. Um, right, Kathy, are, you open, uh, Kathy, Kathy, are you open? Are you open the screen open in two places? If you have the session open two places, that'll cause that echo. Sorry, go ahead, Robert. Yeah. So, um, yeah, we've done a lot on on uh, trying to educate the public on on what it is we do. Um, I forget where I was going on that. Uh, I'll come back to it. But yeah, it, it's just educating the public on what we're doing. We've tried to do comparisons of water rates with cable, telephone, internet, cigarettes. And I don't know why uh, it doesn't resonate. People as a right, and it's declared water as a right by the UN. But what does that mean? And getting it to your house and, and making it properly available. Uh, did those 20 million in the U.S.? have access but not affordably um, or were there 
uh, connection problems. We have those in, in here in Canada with our First Nations and, and proper availability of water. So, mm -hmm. uh, Just to answer the question Kathy posed about having a surcharge for water, it's really not a surcharge. It's a cost of treatment of wastewater. Yeah. And uh, it, it should be defined as such. In fact, in the city of Toronto, we don't even do that because we are one water. We charge one rate for water, wastewater, and stormwater all at one time. And we don't distinguish that this is water, this is wastewater, that's stormwater. Was yeah, that yeah. different across the country, William? Like, is it unique to Toronto or is it similarly like that across the country? Across the country. It's, uh, I think it's, uh, I, it's, a, it's a mixed blend of, of how, how it is charged over. Because yeah. in some yeah. municipalities, stormwater is done by somebody else, not by the one right. who does water, wastewater. Some some municipalities there's no meter, so it becomes even more of a problem. In in Montreal, it's a, it's a, it's the same, uh, William. Yeah, yeah. yeah what you'll amazes take me is uh, is to go to Costco and see people buy, uh, you know, 50, you know, tens and tens of uh, small bottles of uh, yeah. of water because they they trust it better, like they trust it more, uh, mm -hmm. which which really is a nonsense. Uh, so, so, uh, and they're paying for that uh, quite, quite, uh, quite a high price. So that's something that, that needs to be uh, education will be very important there for sure. And, and that's that's what gets me. People complain about a dollar fifty for a liter of gas, but they are willing to pay a dollar fifty for a liter of water. <laughs> and you're selling it for what uh, a, a thousandth of a cent that yeah, liter, exactly. or something like that. Yeah. Nuts. Yeah, no, you'll see places like uh, Halifax is a good example where they tried to introduce the new stormwater fee on top of their water and wastewater. And, and, and their first attempts didn't go as well until they got into the public education and tried to really explain why and then offer incentives to reduce your stormwater. So a lot of our pricing ends up being incentivized to either get water efficiency use to... Uh, be more careful about the water you use, but then also uh, how you're draining your property. A and the more we're watching storms and climate-related events, I think we're starting to appreciate uh, stormwater management more and more now. So unfortunately, disaster is getting us to understand the value of some of those hidden parts. Yeah. Sure. I'm going to cite the, um, the Water Canada Decade uh, fact sheet. I, I love that quote, uh, climate Crisis is a water crisis. Uh, you like it or not, we're going to be addressing water more and more. It's a fact of life that you, it, within uh, not, not 10 years, in, in that one, two years, uh, California has uh, controlled, uh, you, you get fined, like a, a $1,000 fine for uh, um, wetting out your, uh, your, uh, your, uh, your lawn, for example, it's it's crazy. So it's going to change very, very, very rapidly. We have a question. Uh, water may be a human right, but like William says, it's not free. Why don't politicians charge the true cost of water per cubic meter back to consumers? I, I think, can I start that one? Yeah, I was going to sure. get you, William, because here you, yeah. you, know, you speak to that yeah, as I, Toronto. <laughs> and the I think because... I think because we as utilities have done a very poor job of not explaining the cost of water all these years. It, it, it's a, that's my personal belief. I think that we have not, uh, when, when these plants were put in place and the pipes were put in the ground, pipes last for a hundred years. So nobody, it was not explained that at some point in time in the future, these pipes are going to need replacement and nobody put them, the cost was the cost of treatment, not the cost of treatment and replacement. And as a result, a state of good repair backlog started going higher and higher, and our reserves started to go lower and lower. The only way to fix that is to really charge the true cost of water to the consumer, which includes the cost of treatment and the cost of replacement. Sure. Kathy, go ahead. And if I may, this is not unusual to water. We don't. We did the same for roads, for other buildings, for other infrastructure, 
for hydro lines. Like, th this isn't unique to water, this backlog on infrastructure. Asset management and infrastructure deficit is m massive across all of the, uh, you know, all of the services that municipalities um, provide. Part of it has to do with changing technology. Part of it has to do, I would say, with climate change. The, 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 you know, the sewer systems that were created a hundred years ago are not sufficient for the climate that's changing. Water use in individuals, the number of, you know, you could have three people in a house and three bathrooms and water use changes and how people have used water has changed dramatically. And we haven't kept up with those changes like there is a there's a there's a societal change in attitudes and use of water and then there's like climate and then there's um an inability of decision makers to think about things like asset management and long-term replacement so it's it's a it's like everything else it's very very complicated and water has to be taken in water as a service has to be taken in the context of all of the other services that municipalities um, have to provide. Well, to, today, to complete on that, uh, today well, to uh, Montreal announced its uh, its budget actually yesterday, and there's a tax increase uh, without surprise due to the inflation. And um, but what Montreal has been doing quite nicely over the years is to have their report on water. What they do, how much they invest. In what specifically? You can almost go to the street in that report, and um, and then you see the benefits uh, in terms of water loss, which still are important, like too important, but still decreasing significantly. So, uh, in an asset management plan, as politicians, decision makers, public decision makers, investments are shown that the uh, and they have an effect. That makes sense if, if that's the right way to approach it. Uh, a few years back in Ireland, they wanted to increase the, ta the water tax rate significantly, but the government could not even answer how much water they lose in the system. And the answer was astonishingly high. It was like 40 something percent. So don't quote me on this, but it's about the, the, the you know, they were at losing half of their water more or less. So you can't. You can't tell people I'm going to I'm going to raise your taxes because I can't fix my problems. So uh, that fixing, which Toronto does marvelously well, is is the way to go. Long term asset management communicated to the public. Well, I, I want to put a quick plug in there for a report we did at CWWA. We released last year and it, it's for utility leaders. Any of you watching today, and it was called Towards a Sustainable Utility and a big section in there on the guidance document on uh, full cost pricing. It's got checklists and it, it, it's not the only document. It's just a guidance, real simple on how to move forward. And it also gets you to more resources. There's so many. I've asked uh, Jen uh, from Water Canada to throw up some resources today. And I've got some from CWWA. I've got AWWA, WEF, um, Canadian Water Network put one out and Polis Project out of the University of Victoria, I have a great uh, primer there. So there's lots of resources to follow. Mm -hmm. um, I just want to follow up on you know, one of the concerns is the economies of scale. So as much as we try to set a water rate and then we try to look at that backlog of infrastructure and we're trying to move off of, uh, wean off of grants and dependence on provincial federal grants, smaller communities just can't do that. The economies of scale between uh, my town of Prescott or Kathy Stratford versus Toronto, you know, that was much of my work in my master's degree it was called T Toronto versus tiny township. <laughs> and I tried to, it was a real place in Ontario and, and tried to compare how policies work in Toronto and how they might work in, in a, in a smaller community. And, and that's where a lot of our uh, problems exist and we need access to, you know, consistent, reliable funding to, to get a, or address that backlog. And then we can try to get sustainable and long-term. Perfect. Kathy, go ahead. Kathy, go ahead. There's, there's equity. Um, I, I wanted to talk a little. Oh. There you go. There you go.
it keeps cutting out on me and I'm not doing anything. So I don't know okay. why that's You're happening. Good. My apologies. I right. want to talk about equi good. equity, right. equity for individuals who are paying for water. Cause there's that, that's a huge issue within your community. Right. Um, it does, you know, when you, when you say that water should be a hundred percent user pay, then you're actually downloading it onto the more regressive, the most regressive of the tax bases and also the most regressive system when it comes to having um, water rates uh, for who's paying for it. But then also equity between communities, right? Because it's not just size of the community or, or the, the, you know, the, the, the economies of scale. It's also what water goes into your system. What's the chemistry? What are the things that you need to add? We have naturally occurring fluoride in our water. We don't need to actually have that whole system in. Our water tends to be a little bit cheaper in Stratford because of that. There's a whole host of reasons why communities may have more or less. And yet water is a human right. And, and we don't, we have this sort of equalization system built into some of our other utilities like hydro or gas or air travel, train travel. We talked about that the other day where you use, you know, the, the economies of scale that you get from, let's say, the Windsor Toronto um, court or Montreal corridor and via to subsidize others. But we don't have that same mindset when it comes to water as a resource. And so going on a wholly consumer model for water, when we have sort of a mixed model for a lot of our other utilities, utilities is kind of interesting to me. It opens up a whole other question, but it's interesting to me. Uh, Kathy, just so uh, you Kathy, know, just so uh, you we know. are muting you when others are speaking because there's a bit of feedback, but so when you want to say something, just put your finger up and I'll advocate on your behalf and make sure you get in there, okay? <laughs> awesome. All right, where were we at, guys? Let's see. So, um, I when think we get new regulations, sorry. Yeah. In order for us to meet regulations, some of us can do it a lot easier than others. You know, we've got the new uh, wastewater effluent regulations we're trying to meet. And for some communities, it, it means minor tweaks. Others, it means a whole new treatment plant. Uh, in Cape Breton, I think it was working out to, you know, $150,000 per household. Mm -hmm. And you can't put that out to the households to make it practical. And so, yeah, greater assistance needs to come in order to address a lot of those and it doesn't mean amalgamating everyone either that doesn't solve it or address the the topography and the geography that we're dealing with a statistic about that um there's about 20 percent of uh all municipal wastewater that only has a primary treatment or no treatment at all in canada so 20 percent of, of all that water that is uh flowing into the environment is not treated or barely treated. And we see we see a lot of it, and it, it's the source of a, a lot of problem down, down the hole. Larger larger cities like, uh, like uh, those that were mentioned um, introduced tertiary treatment, uh, not enough anymore, with the uh, emerging contaminants, uh, drugs uh, that we find in the water, hormones, We'll have to address it uh, one day or another because um, we're eating that back. So uh, that's that's really that's really where uh, I guess we're repeating ourselves. But the education comes into play. Réseau Environnement in Quebec and there's many other sources. Um, I calculated a, a return on investment uh, on every dollar that's spent by 172 percent profit on that dollar invested. So for each dollar invested, you get 172 back. I don't know many uh, investments that are as um, profitable as this one. So uh, we really ought to 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 uh, well to make those investments visible and explain why they're needed, because uh, the climate is changing and it affects uh, water 90% of the time at least. Okay, we have another question from the audience here. What are examples of municipalities in Canada that are doing a great job of or moving towards balancing affordability slash equity with the true cost of water in their rate designs? So I, I, I'll start that one out. Uh, okay. let, let, me first, let me first start with uh, the concept of full recovery. About 15 years ago, the city of Toronto's state of good repair backlog, uh, my light goes on without with, with no movement. So I had to just <laughs> take a little bit. Yeah. 
uh, about 15 years ago, we did a, a, a document talking about what is the actual state of good repair backlog in the plants and in the stations and in, in the piping. And it was a huge number. We took that document to council and explained to council, I think this is the key. You need the decision makers to understand that we either do something now or we kick this problem down to our children and grandchildren. Uh, there are only two choices. The City of Toronto Council made a really good decision and they increased water rates 9% every year for nine years in a row. Hmm. What that did is it increased our revenue to and, and, and the clear uh, promise to council was all that extra money is going to go into capital renewal, not into operations. So that was the, 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 the one thing that council heard us and said, great. If you're going to put it in capital, renew and replace, we are going to allow you to do that. So we increased our revenue and started putting money into capital. Our capital grew from $200 million a year. Today, we are at $1 billion a year. Uh, so our, our capital renewal has helped us now bring our state of good repair back into a little bit more of a, a better position. So that's on the, on, on the capital. The second one was on equity. Uh, we also have a program within the city of Toronto that everybody is charged a rate. But for those who have uh, who meet certain criteria, they can apply and get a reduced rate of 30 percent. So they can really pay 30 percent, 70 percent of the cost of the water if they meet certain requirements. So they have to submit an application and then we can process uh, their reduced cost. That's how we are handling it in the city of Toronto. Thank you. Kathy, did you want to jump in? I just want to make sure I give you a chance here. Well, I, I'm, I didn't know that uh, that for nine years in a row, you have that 9%. Uh, I wonder why the nine and nine, but uh, besides... Oh, it just, sound, it just sounded nice. Nine for nine, everything <laughs> will be fine. Sometimes you wish things would be as simple as that. Um, but I met some uh, city officials uh, at uh, Houston Water uh, uh, in WIFTEC uh, a few months back. And mm -hmm. uh, the director of uh, the water uh, engineering water over there was dealing with a thousand water main breaks uh, year to date, uh, October 1st. So here goes all his budget. That's, that's it. He, he doesn't have anything, any money, any time to do anything else. Um, while doing that, he's paying probably five times more for the same fix. So, so that transition is is kind of very difficult to do because he, he's got a handful <laughs> of uh, of things to do. But uh, but really, uh, the solution is uh, is is elsewhere. Huh? So, and and by the way, Toronto, and it's not because you're there, um, uh, William, but. Uh, you know, invest way more than the largest cities in, in North America. LA spends a uh, one tenth of what we just heard. Like it's yeah. it's 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 completely non comparable. Uh, so so this this is the largest uh, market for water renewal uh, in the municipal context, for sure. In in perhaps uh, I'm sure in um, the Americas. Yeah, and, and, and you're absolutely right. We had a huge number of water main breaks to start with. And now we've reduced our water main breaks. If you don't do something, the water main breaks are only going to increase, not decrease. So, and so that's where the, the technology guys uh, come in. There are solutions, uh, you know, that were that have been invented in the last, uh, let's say, 25 years that uh, that are quite progressive, innovative. Uh, cheaper, um, you know, uh, the digitalization is a very important tool for addressing and identifying where are where it hurts, where are the problems, and then there's solution providers like us and others that that provide uh, great solutions. We can't just dig a street all the time because uh, there's a water main break. There's tons of other ways to do that. And that, that goes to water treatment uh, for your own service, William. Uh, of course, not only uh, replacement. Um, so, but, but the one thing 
that strikes me is that um, when we go for tender, and I know it's a whole new subject, but uh, when we go for tender, then uh, uh, innovation solution or innovative solutions are, are difficult to uh, to select because they're they're often unique. So uh, we need a pilot demonstration and etc. But that's a cycle of, a, of at least five years of uh, adoption. So uh, people like Robert uh, with cities like Toronto need to work together to sponsor this, showcase this, business case this uh, as much as we can. And, and we're, we're ready to help. Yeah, no, that's a whole other uh, webinar, I think. And we get into affordability of what we're doing through the, um, the RFP process that values the higher cost, the better the the, the percentage for engineering or the the acceptance of innovation, the role of the federal government with uh, promotion of innovation and the infrastructure bank as an innovation insurance. Uh, those are all areas that we got to work on. Uh, but on that question, you know, other uh, there are so many governance models across Canada. And we've talked about that before, the, but they're doing well, Toronto, Waterloo. Um, then you've got places like, Halifax that has a separate corporation and it reports to a provincial regulator on setting their rates and making sure that things are are seen properly. You've got a place like Edmonton that's created a corporation that not only serves their area, but then has become servicing other communities around Alberta, Saskatchewan, and even into the U.S. and is a profit center. So, yeah, it, it's funny how each community takes it on differently. Then I I've spent so many years in small communities where I've done a, a report this big of a 20 year asset management plan and our plan to increase the rates as William did. And I'm told by council say, can you make a one pager <laughs> that just shows all the rates of all the towns around us and make sure our rates the lowest. I'm like, yeah, yeah. yeah but, okay. Well, we're working on that. Us engineers tend to, uh, to go too deep into the, the details. Uh, <laughs> There's, there's always that idea of uh, synthesizing the message to uh, two minutes. That's You're what right. the editors are for. Yeah. Kathy, I think you want to add something here. Go for it. Get Kathy unmuted. There we are. Hmm. hmm. I know that we've uh, been working behind the scenes. Okay. I know as soon as I say, okay, let's move on, then we'll, we'll sort it. Okay, well, wh what I'll do. piling up down there. That's cool. Yeah, that's exactly what I was about to say. So I'm going to go, I'll go to the question box and uh, hopefully Sarah and Kathy can work that out. All right. So what management strategies exist to account for the social inequities or sorry, inequalities that can emerge with adding additional costs to water, a basic survival need? Tough question. Yeah. Shall I restate? Yeah, well, we restate. Oh, you got it. No. Go for it. So, oh, Nina's back. back. I was just <laughs> going to uh, piggyback really quickly on, on what they said about technology because uh, smaller communities don't have like taking a risk on sort of the newer technologies in a way, but also the cost. Um, but we piggybacked on a larger project from a community that was close to us, a larger community, and then for sewer relining, and then we've done water relining. And one of the things that people don't realize, which was really great, is street trees are often the first thing to go when you have to do like open cut and replacement of lines. And so it was a really great way to save trees. So that all this climate change mitigation and everything else, so, but it's not something a community the size of Stratford could have probably taken a chance on if we hadn't been able to sort of piggyback on another project from a larger community that allowed the cost of it to come down for us as well. So there's all the, I think that when we talk about procurement, some joint procurement, some municipalities getting a little more creative in, in, in how they go out for projects would really help. That's great. Thank you. Uh, to, to answer the previous question, I, I think when we raised the, the rates nine for nine, uh, that is issue of equity and cost for people who couldn't afford came in. And as a result, uh, the 30% was uh, uh, put into play. Okay. Yeah, other places will have uh, similar programs. Um, 
you take into consideration growth, you're trying to promote infill in cities and you have new communities. We're always talking about development charges, but very careful about how we use the development charges or improvements that are specific to a, an area. You use local improvement plans that can set rates for the improvements in that area. Um, I don't know, I have difficulty. It's always been an argument of mine between um, are we a utility or are we part of the social services department? The other utilities, the phone and the cable and the gas don't have a separate rate. They're, they get assistance from uh, you know, uh, income distribution programs at a provincial federal level from income taxes to cover income inequalities. But um, we've, as a government, municipally survived, um, supplied service fall under trying to create a system within our own to be that social services assistance. Um, it's a challenge for many communities. And, yeah, and you try to put that into sort of efficiency, conservation minded price strategies as well when your costs are fixed and the water use. So a lot of places have developed fee structures that give you a bare minimum. So we set a low rate that's equal to everyone and you'll get your uh, you know, set rate per month that we think is decent to get by on your basic right. And then everything above that works on a, on a effective variable rate. We have a lot of questions okay. and some really good stuff here too. So I'm going to, I'm going to keep plowing through if you don't mind terribly. All right. Uh, what are the primary limitations to municipalities successfully closing the infrastructure gap in the water sector? Is it political sentiment, lack of financial capacity, lack of knowledge, governance issues? What is it? Mm -hmm. Yeah, it, it, it's all of the above. And I think <laughs> uh, the first thing, and I think the first thing to start with is a state of good repair backlog. What is, what do you truly, truly need? And then you can define a financial structure to be able to take care of that uh, state of good repair backlog. Then you can go to the decision makers and say, listen, here's what we need to do. Here's what it, the impacts are. We need to raise water rates. It's, it's a stage process. Education is a part of it. Uh, and, and, and having the counselors understand that if we don't do things now, things are only going to get worse. Uh, there's a certain amount, amount of trust that you need to build with the with the with the counselors, where, where what you say matters, and well, having having gone through that with the city of Toronto, I can tell you it works really well. But this is a, a very important question they're asking uh, uh, on the te technology front. Lack of knowledge and governance issues are definitely uh, right up there. Uh, you know. The, 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 the known regular mainstream technologies are, are safer. Uh, the, the, these are conservative uh, bodies of decision. So that's that's really uh, uh, an important point. And the governance issues, uh, you know, how uh, money is attributed, how it's spent over a year instead of 10. Um, how do you uh, plan for a budget every year when it's meant to last uh, at least 100 years? So that's that's really a, an important uh, topic to address uh, long term. I, I think uh, William addressed it well. Yeah, and I would say that it's also a little bit of council training. Um, I, I don't remember the statistic, but we were looking at it at the OMWA about uh, what percentage of elected officials have taken even the, the basic standard of care training through Walkerton, and it's quite low. And so and, and so when somebody tells me that, you know, you have a big water report, but give me a two page summary, I think that tells you a little bit of something about people's either the, the, the capacity in the context of everything else that they do or interest in learning about some of this. And so, you know, I have a PhD in biochemistry. So for me, I, I read all of the water reports in detail and I'm pulling things out. And um, but I think. Part of it is is also training for elected officials and they're not just and it goes back to their training on water but then there's like roads and then there's like, like all of the different 
pieces of what counselors are supposed to be doing. And in most municipalities in Ontario, they're part-time, they're part-time counselors. It's not a full-time job. And yet when you think about the complexity of even just the three water, right? The three wastewater, you know, storm and, and water. The complexity of that alone is really quite high. So I think training of, of elected officials is, is a, a really key in this. And training in not just in also asset management, like there's a whole piece of I uh, quite often, you know, if I hear elected officials say, you know, you should have the city budget should be like your home budget. You should and no. And as soon as someone says it says that it's like, oh, no, sort of back up. And there needs to be a lot of training around budgets and long term planning and asset management and, and that it just doesn't often happen. After the tragedy of Walkerton. Uh, Justice Dennis O'Connor, uh, one of the requirements he put, and he really did it nicely, that he made the counselors and the people responsible at the decision-making level responsible. So as so for me, if I don't take a council report and tell council this is what we need to do, shame on me. The problem is mine. But if I do take it to council and they reject it, then the issue becomes theirs. So... Uh, it, it is important to bring it to council and regarding the training, the basic training, we have an outside party come in and do training for our counselors. Uh, it's a half a day training, mandatory. You got to take it. Uh, and they have to understand what the liability is on them personally. So that's what we take to council and we say, now that we have a new council, we've got to plan that all over again because there are new counselors that have come on to council which we'll need to do that again. But I would strongly suggest that all uh, city councillors, uh, municipal councillors go through this training. Uh, it, 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 it opens their eyes to what their responsibilities are. I always say that's the one thing you can go to jail for. <laughs> correct. <laughs> sort of like a short as but correct. correct right? <laughs> yes. Yep. But that's a double-edged sword so that that uh, uh, puts uh, a council politician in a position where they reluctant to take risks, uh, which they perceive as risk uh, with, with new technology, for example. So education part needs to be quite strong to uh, counter that effect, uh, I, I should say. Yeah. For sure. yeah, the public, if the, the studies have shown, that the, and Kathy said, they don't complain so much if they understand what, the, what it's for. If you're asking them for more money, you've got to explain why and to counsel, and you've got to know, and it goes back to what William said, asset management, uh, having your inventory done, knowing what your priorities are. Uh, there's a lot of money from FCM to support communities in asset management and capacity building, and then tying those federal grants and provincial grants to asset management and, and making your case when you're, when you're moving forward. We have a, another really good question here. And I think Robert, this is, kind of rings true to some of the conversations we've had too. How do you tell residents their water system needs additional funding without losing trust in the system itself? For example, if you show a resident a picture of a rusty pipe as a reason for increased funding, will that impact their want to drink from those pipes? Less <laughs> residents drinking tap water means less rates, therefore further increasing the funding gap. Um, if I may, uh... That, that would be the wrong approach to to show that pipe. Uh, <laughs> I'd go for statistics on uh, water loss. Uh, you know, 10 to 30 percent of the water bills in Ontario uh, cover for cost and leaky pipes. So that that tells that's it, that tells it all. You you just uh, address it. Uh, uh, in, in, you know, informing the public that uh, by doing so uh, you get more uh, flow rate, so better flow rate, better pressure capacity. Uh, reduce uh, leaky pipes, for example, if it's uh, if it's that the, the problem that's fixed, or if it's a quality water quality problem, uh, uh, you know, with the investment that we're seeing uh, out of uh, new contaminants in water, that that'll become clear with um, with the public awareness uh, increasing that uh, those investments are needed. Uh, Walkerton is a good example, but then there's a uh, the Flint, Michigan example. And then there's this um, uh, Louisiana and um, Mississippi City, uh, Jackson, which is another example. And recently, Houston lost its water. And that's 
all out of a poorly maintained system. And that, that is serious cost today in Houston, that it, you know, at least yesterday, I don't know about today. So that, that yeah. impacts millions. Uh, so that's that becomes very important. Yeah, but drinking water is one part of the water supply that we do to the home. There is showers, there is washing in the in the sink. There's all kinds of things. So yeah, even if the homeowner wants to buy bottled water for drinking, there's a whole other other set of water that you you can't. You you have to take it from the tap. And therefore we so don't show them the brown pipe. I mean, unless somebody understands what the what, what brown water is. We've had issues where uh, on flushing of a line, the brown water into the home. Then you got to go and explain to them we are changing the pipe out, we are putting a new plastic pipe or whatever the, the the circumstances is. But people understand when you tell them and explain to them that yes, you, you we need to in, to put money into the infrastructure to protect you and to protect you and your children and grandchildren. For sure. Yeah, and there's a question also on there about leak detection, and I think that mm -hmm. ties in with kind of okay. and the importance of that. And Martin's discussed how much water we lose all the time. Um, you know, you take a place like Calgary; that's really important when they have scarcity, and a lot of communities in BC that have water scarcity. Yeah, it's worth it to cut that down, and, and the community finds out. Look, I'm turning off my tap to brush my teeth. I'm a low flow shower head. I got a low flow toilet. What? You're wasting 30% of the water and I'm killing myself at home and you guys are wasting it. And then in, in Eastern Canada, Ontario, Quebec, where water seems endless, we, we talk energy, the energy required to operate our systems. And if we're wasting 30% that we could reduce that and reduce the GHGs that uh, you know, now we have GHG targets in our communities. So that leak detection and addressing that becomes so critical to our argument as, of what it is and why we're doing it. And, and then that gamble every year, if you roll the dice and think you can get away with it for another year, it always costs a lot more when a system collapses, when a system fails versus a planned repair. We know the story of Ottawa. I think it was a $1 million repair on a, on a drain pipe and we put it off and we put it off and put it off. Then it collapsed, ate a car. The guy almost died and it was 5 million to fix it quickly. Not to mention it shut off a third of the city and they were sued by the local mall and everything that shut down a third of the city because of <laughs> deferred maintenance. If you remember, we were in Ottawa when that happened. Yeah. <laughs> Oh yeah, that was the difference. That was part. We watched that one downtown. I'm talking. About, there was one out in the East End that really uh, was a perfect I, classic case. I want to come back to the issue that Robert brought up about Robert and Mark brought up about water loss. Water loss has, if you can curb water loss, it has a double benefit to you. Number one is in the cost of water because that water is going down the drain, but more importantly it pushes back your next expansion because you've now recovered that much capacity, which you don't need to put another plant expansion, which is big money. So, Imagine. so, so you need to bring your water loss into some kind of, a, you're always going to get water loss. It's never going to be zero. Um, try and bring it to as low as possible. Imagine if we could uh, expand by 30% our capacity. Uh, it's, Correct. Yeah, you know, uh, in Canada, more or less uh, half of the uh, water main distribution and transmission network is uh, near or at the end of life. Uh, depends on the region. It's one third to half. Um, the fix is important in terms of cost, but the, the, the payback is, is gigantic. It's gigantic, correct? Yeah, 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 for sure. I cannot believe how fast this time has gone. Um, we have about six minutes. I want to make sure you guys have time for final thoughts. So what I'm going to do now is I'll go around. Um, we've got quite a lot of resources happening here in the chat, which is great. So basically have a minute. Final thoughts that you would like to leave with our audience today, kind of the key elements that we discussed. Um, if there's a resource that you want to point to, now is a good time to mention it as well. 
Uh, Robert, I, mean, I know you've already mentioned Bruce, but I am going to start with you because clockwise you're a top for me. <laughs> so <laughs> that's why you get chosen. Uh, so go for it. I, I think I covered my main thought the last time was about the importance of explaining things to the public. Without the public involved, you're not going anywhere. You know, and even if you get the council educated, they're, they've said to me, right, I, I get it, but we'll be pro we'll, you, they'll kill us if we try to do that, Robert. So a lot of them like to push it up to the provincial level or federal and say, oh, the province is making us do this. So we work at that level. But I think if you can build that um, understanding, appreciation at the public level, they will support the counselors who are getting more and more educated all the time. But they're only educated by the information that we can give them as utility experts, um, knowing our systems, knowing the priorities of what we have to do, and explaining those benefits that William said, that not only the reduced costs, but you know we've reduced expansion. And now we can put in that whole new Western development that we've been delaying. Calgary can open up more industry that they've turned away because of their lack of water. John. <laughs> All right. Yeah. Go ahead, William. You and, might and, as well go next. You look like you will have something yeah, to add. I just, I just want to, to respond yeah. to also what Robert said. Go for it. I think it is, it is very critical that we get the decision makers. The decision makers have been elected by people. And the decision makers are elected for a simple reason to give them the best service possible. And so educating the decision makers and showing the decision makers what their responsibilities and what their risks are, once they recognize that, they can then tell the public what's going on. They can explain to the public that that elected them why water rates are going up. Perfect. Thank you. Martin? Yeah, as a final thought, um, as I said in the introduction, we, while we are surrounded by water, um, this resources is, is not as large as we think. And uh, while we have a lot of it compared to other countries, um, it's being threatened by climate change. Uh, Canada uh, uh, warms up twice as fast as the global warming uh, rate. And a large part of those changes, 90% according to Canada Water Decade, affects water directly. Droughts, floodings, uh, water quality, contamination. Uh, remember that close to half a million Canadians don't have access to water today. Half a million. That's that's large. So while the value um, of of that water is uh, no, in effect, the value of water right now is minimal. We don't pay for it, and therefore it has no value and it's not cherished. But the cost, we heard about a, a billion point two uh, uh, at Toronto. That the, the cost is very very high. So uh, that equation need, need to be equalized. Value needs to equal to cost. Right now, it's it's far from that. So education, uh, public awareness, uh, in long term investment is is the way to go. Thank you, Martin. All right, Kathy, bring us home. So I was going to say, so not being afraid to take on big challenges, I think, is something that I want to leave with. And I'm just going to, the, the lead service line issue is another one sort of kind of like the elephant in the room quite often when we're talking about water. But I think I'm going to go back. I was chair of the health unit board, so my my, my background is in biochemistry and, and that field. And we proved with COVID that we can take on big problems and solve big problems if everybody sort of rose in the same direction. I think water, climate change, water, all of the issues with water are exactly like that. It is always less expensive if we deal with it now. And I and and I don't I I don't the core idea is it the municipality is it the province is it the feds it's all all of the above with all and the consumer right so I, my takeaway from all this is is that anything complicated will have a complicated solution but there's always a solution and that it's also iterative what we're going to do today might be a little different than what we're going to do ten years from now because of technology or emerging threats or things that are different. And that the public should be okay with flexibility, right, in what we're doing. And I think that's something we don't do very well. 
Thank you so much. Go ahead, William. I just want to to, to end on a positive note. Okay. Just talking about the, just talking about all these issues is fantastic because it brings to mind what we need to do for the future and how we need to go ahead with replacement of infrastructure, with reducing water loss, and with expanding, uh, you know, pushing the plant expansions down the road. Great comment, William. Yes, thank you. And thank you to all of our panelists. This has been incredibly informative. Thank you to all of you that tuned in. I'm so sorry we didn't get to all your questions. We have a uh, an embarrassment of riches in the questions today, but it's really good questions. So thank you for that. It makes my job easier. But your interest and participation through the chat and through those questions does make these sessions a lot more fun and this really brings a nice sense of community. Once again, thank you to Ultra Proven Solutions for sponsoring today's webinar. We wouldn't be able to host important discussions like this one without industry support. And thank you again for joining us today. Keep an eye peeled for the future Water Canada webinars, and we will see you next time.